For those of you that don't know me, just in case you don't, my name is Jake Reeves. I'm the creative arts pastor here at New Life. And uh, just because Sarah and I love you guys so much, we come and hang out on Wednesdays with you. So, mm-hmm. so it makes me the best, right? Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, before we get going, uh, I'm going to spare you guys my the thing I did for the middle schoolers. I must be like one of fake best 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 No. Carson, do you want to? Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. All right. All right. Since most of you are in charge, you have to do it, so we're going to do a military for us, I guess. Um, hey, hey, it's, it's light. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that you're doing the heaviest military press of your life, and I need you to do the most annoying grunt struggle that you possibly can while you lift it up. All right, so one, two, three, go! <laughs> oh man, that was actually way more entertaining than the middle schoolers. I'm going to give you guys credit for that. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. Well, then after that, we have to do our post workout cool down. So, we're going to do some breathing exercises. So, when I, are you going to close your eyes? Everyone, close your eyes. All right. Ready? And then I'm going to call for a breathe in. Hold. And <laughs> All right. And breathe in. Hold. Yeah, really. <laughs> All right. Why am I doing that? Um, a, because we're lifting weights. They're heavy, and tonight is going to be heavy. See the correlation? Uh, All right. But before we get going, and I'm dead serious with you, for you guys, my one ask is right now, if you need, pull out your phone, and if you're in the middle of a conversation with somebody, I want you to snap them back. I want you to text them back. I want you to contact them because I do not want phones out there in this. So I'm permitting it right now. If you're in the middle of a snap conversation with someone, to pull it out. I will come and be in your snap right now if you need me to. But, uh, no, I'm dead serious. Like, we'll take a minute here because I don't want phones out with this and I sit in the back and I watch you guys sneak it. So it's all right. Um, all right. Tell them you'll talk to them again in about 20 minutes. We're just hanging out, guys. Hanging out. All right. 15 seconds. Get them wrapped up. Good? All right. Thank you so much. All right. So kind of going off the heavy thing. Most of you guys know what that means by now, right? That's stuff like when your classmate gets cancer, uh, when your parents get divorced, and all you wanted was for them to be together forever and ever, or when you lose someone you really love, that's stuff that we talk about is heavy. I want to talk about it, it's heavy. Um, so today's lesson, it is along the lines of life or death. So it kind of stinks because I think my first lesson with you guys is so intense and not just, I don't know, joyous and hilarious or whatever. But it's important. So that's it. So this is my uh, birthday present, is apparently getting to bring the heavy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much. All right, before we get into it, there's a couple of things that um, just as one of your pastors I want to talk about, and that is who has been here in one of the weeks where we've talked about David's life. Hands up. All right, couple. I know we have a couple new people, which is totally fine. So we've been going through the life of David in the Old Testament, and who has sat there and be totally honest, guys, please, and thought, this is boring or it doesn't give application in my life. All right, leaders, make sure you see those hands. They are terrible people. No, um, no, seriously, guys, I want, what I want you to know is, first off, I want you to know that you're not alone. And I'm not saying that what you're feeling is right, but I want, what I want you to know is that there are adults who struggle with the Old Testament and its practicality beyond simply God breathed it, so I probably should read it. But let me kind of help you reframe your mind on this as we think about going through daily life. So let's imagine that you are from another world entirely, right? You have no idea what the United States is. You have no idea what's going on in Africa. Um, you have no idea. You've been plopped down in the United States of America, and you are looking um, at the, your classmates. You're looking across social media, and you're seeing 
the things that are happening today. You are seeing things like racial tension. You are seeing things like women's issues or things that are very similar to that that are not a clear-cut thing. How shallow, remember, you have no understanding of what's going on. How shallow is your understanding of the situation if you don't know about slavery, if you don't know about segregation, if you don't know about the oppression that so many of these people have suffered at the hands of primarily white men for years upon years? Well, I'm not here to speak on that specifically, but I want you to think that you couldn't really grapple with those issues, you couldn't really think about those issues if you don't understand the history of slavery or the history of women being treated as property to help you give a context to why it's so important that we genuinely and honestly look at these things and not brush them off. And in the same way, guys, I want you to know that history is important. And throughout the next time, that the next time you're zoning off in social studies. It's important. In the same way, if you just read the New Testament with no understanding of the Old Testament, Beyond Jesus came, he lived, and he died for our sins. It's still free and powerful. It doesn't change what happened at that point. It doesn't change what it did for us. However, you are missing the entire history and context of Israel and the people that came before that. The Jewish people that were swore that they needed a ruler here on this earth. You are missing the entire point of that God had endured centuries of his creation, this thing that he loved, turn from him and continually, as he draw them near, they would turn their back on him and turn their back on, on what he wanted. Centuries of disobedience and separating themselves from him. This is why context matters so much. And it makes our salvation, it makes what Jesus did on the cross in the New Testament so powerful, so beautiful, and so wildly necessary. Not something that God just happened to throw on the table to see if, you know, let's try something else and it happened to benefit us. The reason so many of you might be frustrated with this series of the Old Testament in general is because you aren't, because you aren't thinking of this, the Scriptures as the beginning of our story. It's not just something that exists purely in this book. Because you're thinking that it's merely a book that God wrote that has some key principles that are pretty neat about how to love people and some grace. And the rest really is just for biblical scholars. This book is a love letter written better than any other in history. And most of you will only ever truly read and care about this much. A couple pages. A couple things about love, a couple things about grace, a couple things about forgiveness. And then you'll put the rest of it and be like, I don't really know that. I don't really like what it says in there. I don't really see the practicality of it. But it plays in so much to what we see in Jesus. It plays so much into what we see at the beginning of the church. It plays so much into what's going on in our lives now. So as we're going through this, I don't want, like, I'm not thinking that this is going to radically just blow your minds and all of a sudden you're going to have a deep appreciation for what's brought out here in every piece of scripture. I can only hope that you don't dismiss what's taught up here before it's ever said, before you hear the words of God and before you see the story that's been laid out. So that's my past for Soapbox. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you guys because I know, like, I've, I've heard feedback, but I, it's tough for me because I love you guys, and I want you to love this as much as I do, and not take as long as it took me, because I struggled to genuinely care about the entire scripture until about seven or eight years ago. I like the New Testament. I like the things that Jesus did. I like the things that he said. But all the stuff about the kings, all the stuff about David, all the stuff about creation, it was just like, yeah, I get it. It's kind of like the stuff we have to get to. But it, it colors so much of why it was so beautiful and so powerful that Jesus did come, that he did come, and he did give his life and rise, raise again from the dead. So I just want to challenge you guys with that. So I promise to tell you, right, I have not forgotten. That might have been me just kind of like trying to charge your brains a little bit and rethink as we go through this series about how it's so important that these leaders are bringing the message to you week after week as we go through David's story. So we've been following David's rise from nothing and watched his rough relationship with Saul at this point. And has recently involved Saul just trying to kill David. Um, today is the end of the road for Saul. His demise is all too relevant and something you all will encounter in your life at some point. I'm going to paraphrase a good portion of Saul's life uh, to paint 
uh, how we get to his death. So pay attention to what's happening at each step as we get to his death. Um, and let's watch this downward, downward spiral. But we're going to start off, I want to remind you who Saul is. First of all, Saul is described as a very good-looking and well-spoken dude. I kind of think of him as a Chris Hemsworth type. And I'm trying to remember, one of the middle schoolers said, what was it? Oh, man, they, they were like, oh, it's Ant-Man or something. And I'm just like, no, it's Thor. Guys, so, and it's an extremely attractive man that both Sarah and I agree is attractive. Does anyone deny that, that Chris Hemsworth is attractive in this room? Oh, there, there are a couple. Okay, guys, fine. Be the tra- detractors. No, anyway, he was described as a very attractive, well-spoken man, so he could, he could make his way around a room. So he didn't run for the kingship. And uh, going to the next thing, he was appointed to the king of Israel because Israel, they swore they needed a king again. This was at a point where they felt that they needed a king to be unified. And initially, Saul was actually pretty successful. He had God with him. But over time, David got in the picture, as we know, and it became, began to put tension because people really liked David, and they liked what David accomplished. And so then Saul pursued and has been trying to kill David continuously. And so that's where we're going to take a step back, and we're going to look at Saul's life in particular and how we get to his death that we're covering today. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase these a little bit. We're going to kind of jump through scripts, and then we're going to read some later. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel, uh, starting off first in chapter 13, and then we're going to move forward into uh, chapter 15. First, we see uh, Saul makes a series of bad decisions. And the first of which is we see Saul not paying attention to Samuel, who, if you remember, Samuel is one of God's prophets. So this means that he has ignored wise counsel because he had been given instructions about how to do this sacrifice, how to go through this, and uh, Saul got impatient and went ahead and did it himself anyway. And I want you to look at this, and how many times do we ignore wise counsel? How many times do you not listen to your parents, do you not listen to your teachers, to your coaches, to your extremely handsome worship pastors, how many times do we not listen? A lot, guys. A lot. Are you listening right now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I got you. Okay. So we have right here, he doesn't listen to wise counsel. Let's go forward to 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 35. At this point, God is giving Saul instructions to destroy the Amalekites. So Saul and God, they're still in communion with it. And so he gives him uh, instructions to destroy the Amalekites for their attacks on Israel in times past. Guys, I told you, the Old Testament, it's frustrating. It's annoying. It's a history book. God had to do interesting and just terrible things to keep his people holy because Jesus hadn't come yet. He hadn't paid with his blood. So he had to cleanse the land of people that would distract them and pull them away from him. And so God tells him he has to destroy the Amalekites, but he gets cute. How many of you get cute? And I'm not talking about being cute. How many, like, like your parents are like, oh, that's very cute. Nobody's told that. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> you see, instead of actually killing all of the Amalekites and everything that they had, Saul spares their king and their best livestock. He got cute. He got, well, surely if I kill all of them, but I saved the king as a mantelpiece and an example of who we conquered. And I keep their best livestock because that's going to benefit my people. Surely that's a good thing. I mean, how many times have you guys ever, you've done what your parents have said. When your parents were like, hey, it's fine you're going over to their house, just don't go anywhere else. And you're like, well, if I go to somewhere else but I'm back to their house by the time they pick me up, is that really that bad? That's getting cute. It's still lying. It's still disobedience. And so we see that Saul is making these little decisions all along the way that are starting to separate him from God's will. So let's move forward and we go into 1 Samuel 22, 6 through 23. At this point, Saul is pursuing David. And uh, so we've been kind of covering this the last couple of weeks. And David finds shelter and food with the priests, with some priests there. And after David leaves, Saul comes and he finds the priest and he finds out that they helped David. And so he slaughters every single one of them. Eighty-five priests who all they did was offer him shelter and food. Saul kills them all. And the women and children living in the small village that they were in. Saul's vengeance 
was, pre- was laid out on innocence. And I'm curious, have you guys, have you ever punished one of your friends, somebody you know, because they were being nice to somebody or they were trying to help somebody that you didn't like? Somebody that had wronged you, somebody that you're like, how can you be nice to them? Don't you know what they did to me? This is exactly what's happening here. Because Saul is so angry that these priests help the person that he is vengeful toward. Or maybe you've been punished by someone that you have, uh, and you're just like, I'm a bystander. I just, you know, I gave them food or, or I gave them a ride, and now you're mad at me just because I helped them. So you're starting to see that Saul, his vengeance is, has played out into a longer story of him downward spiraling. Next, we move forward in the first Samuel 28, 1 through 25. At this point, Saul is completely separated away from God. He can't hear from him anymore. He's made bad decision after bad decision. And he's getting ready for battle. And he seeks a medium. Do you guys know what that is? It's just right above a small and below a lane. <laughs> it's okay, guys. It's okay. Yeah, no, that's not what a medium is in this sense. A medium is someone who speaks to spirits. It's someone that, that is, is trying to speak to the dead. And worse yet, he goes to this medium instead of seeking out God. And this medium conjures up the spirit of Samuel. Samuel, the prophet that he hadn't listened to earlier. And Samuel's in just, he's mad at him. He's like, why have you done this? And God is mad because it's a desecration. So my question is, how many of you have ever created a bad situation? You have created the bad situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you made that situation worse by more bad decisions? Yeah, I should like to see all of them. <laughs> this is exactly what Saul is doing. Saul has walked down this road and made bad decision after bad decision. He's separated from God. And rather than getting on his knees and being like, God, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm just going to wait until I hear from you. Saul's like, well, if I'm not going to hear from you, I'm going to go get a medium. And so it gets even worse for him. And so now we're going to jump forward once more to 1 Samuel 31. And we're going to read this. You see, Saul's journey, uh, 31, 1 through 4, if you want to catch up with us. Uh, I'm actually going to have someone read this. Saul's journey away from God is a slow one. It's not overnight. It's not one thing. It's a slow tick away from God. You see, and it's in the same way our journey to know God and fully appreciate God, it's slow. That's why sometimes we ask you guys to, to do things even though it doesn't make sense because over time it will pay dividends. Over time it will make sense. But a lot of times in the immediate, it just doesn't. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to know it right away. So here, uh, and this is why every decision that we make points the bow of our ship towards some destination. So we all are in a ship of some sort. No, we're not shipping someone. No, okay, yeah. See, I, I feel semi-young for understanding that. But um, we're not shipping someone. We are physically a ship. And every decision you make, it points your bow. It points the front of your ship towards something, whether it's God, whether it's uh, popularity, whether it's towards an idol. No, every decision we make, points our ship towards something. And we have seen Saul make decision after decision here. So let's look at 1 Samuel 31, 1 through 4. Who wants to read it? Go ahead, Susan. Be loud. And on the names, don't worry about it. Just say whatever you want. This guy's got an arrow in him. Keep going. Thank you. you guys catch what happened there? Uh, he killed himself. So Saul is in battle at this point. His army has been slaughtered. Even on top of that, his sons, Jonathan, who we're calling Dab, 
Malchus, who others? They have all fallen. He's lost his army. He's lost his sons. And he himself has been wounded. And so Saul, he's saying to his armor bearer, kill me before these pagan Philistines, before these people who aren't believers, which is kind of ironic when you see what Saul has come through. They come and torture me. But his armor bearer, he wouldn't kill him. And so Saul ends up taking his sword, turning it on himself, and he fell on it. So why do we possibly care here in 2018 about a, a dude thousands of years ago that pretty much made his own bed? Like, if we look through his decisions time and time again, why do we care about his demise? Because suicide, whether from a disgraced king from centuries long ago, to the two kids who just killed themselves, which Johnny mentioned, I don't know if you guys heard about that, it follows the same path. And that was just days ago. The need to keep living and going dwindles away due to our personal choices. Now, this might sound kind of stupid to some people. Because a lot of people, your reaction might just be, well, just feel better. Just count your blessings. Just stop being so selfish. Just stop doing this. Stop doing that. And all of this is actually wildly unhelpful to people contemplating suicide, going through this. And why, why do I know this? It's not because I'm a doctor. Even though I love wearing lab coats on that. And it's not because I'm your pastor. That doesn't make me any more qualified than anyone else. But it's because I have been there. Because I have contemplated suicide myself. Now, you guys are going to hear a lot more about my testimony and Sarah's testimony for February as we talk about relationships and sex and dating and all that jazz. Um, but I want to kind of cover the part of my testimony that has to do with suicide, which is a massive piece of it. This began in seventh grade. Like, seventh grade. So for a lot of you guys, you're like, man, that was so long ago. Like, that was a long time ago. But it continued on and forth. So I want you to stay with you. That this isn't something that, that it's like, ah, like I just have to wait until, you know, I'm going to have to deal with that in a couple of years. Like, there are kids that have already been dealing with it long before this. There are kids that are dealing with it right now. And there are friends that they're going to keep dealing with it even after you get out of high school. So, this started out with, uh, I was in a relationship. Um, as most things start out. And I was in seventh grade and I was dating a girl who I shouldn't have been dating. Um, she had been abused, um, most likely physical, most likely in other ways. Um, and she was not healthy. She was not good for me. My parents tried to tell me, my friends tried to tell me. And we tried to date for a while. Things got too far. Um, we ended up being regularly sexually active at that point. Um, which, thinking of where you were in seventh grade, that is not something that a seventh grader can mentally and emotionally handle. And so it wasn't before long that the relationship crumbled apart, and I tried to get out of it at that point. And a suicide threat came from heaven. And I don't know if you guys have ever know what suicide, suicide threats are, but essentially it's where you're talking to a person and they're threatening their life in order to get you to do something, to stay on the line, to come visit them, to stay in a relationship, whatever it is, they're trying to manipulate you into some action. I was in seventh grade. I had no idea how to deal with it. I wasn't equipped to prepare. I was going to talk about the fallout of that here in a little bit, but before we get there, I want to bring it up a little bit, you know, because I can feel that it's kind of like sitting heavy. And I want to give you a little bit of backstory on just me as a person and what I've come through and where I'm at. So first off, fun fact, I'm the exact same height that I was in seventh grade. Yeah, I was a huge seventh grader. So um, I dominated in basketball. Um, football, it didn't matter. Um, unfortunately, as you can imagine, as middle school and high school went on and everyone got taller than me, it was really sad for me. And then I progressively went further back and back. It's probably why I landed on uh, golf as my primary like, sport. Um, but i will tell you that just like, I was athletic, I was popular, I was intelligent, and I was as good looking as a middle schooler can be. At least my mom told me. Um, 
I was raised in an upper middle class family. My dad was a doctor. Um, my parents were together, and they still are. They are. They took me to church all the time. We were in a great family unit. Um, I was voted student class president from sixth grade and on, and later student body president once I got to high school. I was captain on all my sports teams, despite me not being any taller. Um, I was president of the Honor Society. I ended up graduating valedictorian in my class and was the primary student leader in my youth group. In fact, I wrote a 30-minute skit and play my senior year for Youth Sunday uh, about prior- spiritual priorities and stereotypes, and she was my wife in that play. Oh, I know. We weren't dating at that point. So I was just trying to write my, my future guys. So any guys who are trying to, uh, you know, woo a girl, like write a play, put it as your wife, it works every time. I know one time. <laughs> First off, that is not the system to boast. But it's for you to realize that if anybody in this room, anybody in the, the state of Kansas, in the United States, could have an earthly reason to keep breathing and to not give in to suicide and depression, it's me. I had everything I needed in this world. I had intelligence, I had athletics, I had uh, money, I pretty much had what I needed to get through life. So I began contemplating suicide in 8th grade. In the fall of that relationship, as I told you, we made poor decisions and started sleeping together. And um, I started... Um, um, at the end of that, to have uh, suicidal thoughts of my own and calling my own suicide threats because I was so emptied out as a human being because I was trying to be this knight in shining armor for this girl, which I couldn't be. I couldn't be what would fix me. I remember the very first time uh, that I ended up in my room. I was home alone uh, in eighth grade, and uh, my dad and I at that point, we were still pretty avid, uh, clear, and pleasant hunters. And he said, my parents had no idea what was going on. No idea what was going on. And so I'd gone downstairs and I'd grabbed the shotgun and I went into my room and I sat on the edge of my bed with it laid out in front of me, just wanting to pull the children in. And if it wasn't for the fact that my parents came home early from wherever they were at, I don't even remember at this point, and caught me right there, I don't know what would happen to them. You see, but I went to therapy, but I didn't really try. It was one of those things where I wasn't really ready. I didn't know what was going on. They didn't know how to deal with that. It was a level of depression. It was a level of brokenness that they hadn't seen before. And so on December 8, 2002, I will remember that date until the day I got it. December 8, 2002. Were all you born after 2002? Okay. Well, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got to see, you know, where, where we're sitting right now. Two years old. So you guys might be potty trained. Might be potty trained at this point. Okay, okay. December 8, 2002. I will never forget that date. I will forget a lot in my life. I will forget Sarah's birthday because it's a prime number in January, the 17th. Like, I will think it's the 19th forever and ever. But I will not forget this date because I was a freshman in high school. At this point, um, I was dating a different girl. Like I said, I was still extremely broken. Um, I hadn't really given therapy a chance. And uh, the girl I, I dating, uh, the girl I was dating, called to say it was over because uh, we had, had a pregnancy scare. And I was already teetering te- te- on the edge in my own life with my obsession. And it was with that that I had I had tried uh, suicide threats on her and tried to manipulate her. And thankfully for her sake, she got away. And she got healthy. But with that, I didn't know what to do. And so I, from that point, I stole my parents' car. I ran away from home with no plan. And about 50 miles away from home, um, I stopped on this bluff, kind of looking out over Kansas. And uh, there is where I attempted to kill myself. Because I didn't believe anything was left in this world that could make me want to draw breath in the beginning. Lucky for me, my parents were home when I stole the car. So, uh, so they figured out very quick that I was gone. They called the cops. Uh, they had planes out searching for me. And um, the cops found me. Uh, as I had only slit one wrist at this point and not very deep. Um, I was placed in handcuffs at that point as they had made sure that I was safe. And from that point, I was taken back and taken to an interrogation room. 
Uh, where after we had gone through that, they had spoke with my parents and essentially said I could voluntarily choose to go to rehab or uh, the state would require me to go to somewhere. And so I went to rehab. I chose, obviously. Um, rehab is kind of a scary place. And I say that because society paints it in a very, obviously a very negative light that it's people that just can't get their act together. And so when you walk through those doors and you're there with people who are hearing voices, people who can't get a grip on reality, and you are this kid that was supposed to have your life together and you have everything, it is the most humbling, breaking experience you can possibly have in your life to realize how far you have jumped. And it was at this point that I went through, and, and I didn't tell you, but like the town I grew up in was like 4,000 people. Like, so people knew what went down there. My school knew, my class knew, my friends knew. But the truth was, we had saved me. And it wasn't even that they necessarily taught me that much about Jesus. They let you have times of reflection. They encouraged spiritual connection. But it was my upbringing and youth group and everything. And I'm like, well, I guess this is probably what I can talk to them. And it was through that that I spent enough time and just spent enough time in self-reflection and thinking about who I was that I could go back to school. The entire school knew at that point. I went back. I was... Uh, Pardon me, but I was labeled an effing lunatic, an emo boy. Uh, the popular kids mocked me relentlessly. Uh, everything that I had held in darkness, everything that, that when you walk in to, to school that you don't let people see, all of that stuff got shoved out. People could see all the brokenness. People could see everything that was wrong with me. And it was truthfully that that absolutely saved my life more than anything else. Because there was no other choice than to walk towards Christ at that point. Because people could see everything. I couldn't put up a front. I couldn't put up that I was, you know, oh, no, it's fine. Like, yeah, I'm just the same old Jake. Like, people knew who I was. Which is funny because most of us spending our entire life want people to know us intimately. They want us to know. They want, they want people to know us deeply. They want us to know the real us and not have to learn. And I got forced into it. Now, I struggled to kind of get back on track. I tried to get into relationships the same way, seek popularity and everything, get back and, and force the same way I had. But everything just kind of kept folding in on itself. Nothing ever to the same scale that it was before, but it just never was quite what it should be. And so my senior year, I kind of reached the point in Sarah, like, it's the beautiful thing about growing up with your wife in a sense, is she can remember all this happening from an outside perspective. My senior year, something just clicked, and I'm like, None of this is fulfilling me. I am accomplishing everything I want to do on the football field. I am accomplishing everything I want to do in the classroom, everything I want to do in drama, everything I want to do in this. I'm getting it, and I'm still miserable. And so the one thing I really hadn't done was absolutely dive head first into Jesus. I kept going to youth group because my parents would kill me if I didn't. And so I kept staying plugged in, and, and everyone had kept pouring into me and loving me. And, and so I'm like, okay, I don't care what anyone says. Like, nothing else is working. I am just going all out for Christ. I am getting weird. And I got weird. Um, man, I, like, I seriously poured all my energy into the friends that I had at that youth group because I recognized that these were the people that were building me up. These were the people that were there when I came back. Like, it was such a rocky road with the other people that were like, well, are you okay? Like, can I talk to you? They didn't care. They were like, we love you, man. Come on back. And so I realized that why am I spending all my energy on these people who could care less if I had done it? If I had actually finally pulled that trigger when these people were waiting for me. And so I just dove all in. I mean, I made these super cheesy shirts because people call us the God Squad. I made shirts that said God Squad because I'm like, I'm going to own it. I'm not going to let people, I'm not going to let people put this on us. And it was fun. And the, the hilarious thing, guys, is I still love people extremely well during that time. It didn't matter what clique they were in. I loved them. And despite me not playing the game of high school, despite me not playing into that, like I said, I still graduated ballot touring. I still was able to be elected to those things. You want to know why? Because people respected me for not falling apart. People respected me that I went deeper into Christ and didn't get fold in on the which is crazy because it ended up being my strongest piece of testimony that I still have the notes 
uh, from the most random classmates ever who told me that I had completely changed their life. And I'm like, I thought I sucked at this the entire time. I thought I was still just this broken man. And so, guys, I want to tell you this as we kind of get through, and I'm trying to wrap through this end here. If depression, anxiety, and suicide do not look like the same thing on everybody, it can be the most popular kid in school to the kid who can't wait to go home and get high because his dad is probably going to beat him when he gets home. It can creep up, creep up on us, on someone who is deeply in God's favor, but they begin to make poor decisions to separate themselves from actually obeying God, just like we saw in Saul's life. Saul was with God. Saul had a deep communion with God, and decision after decision pulled him away. So if you struggle with cutting, depression, suicidal thoughts, or deal with someone who is, let me be another or the first to say to you, I am here, and I love you, God. I am here, and I love you, God. What you're experiencing is real. You are not weaker or created poorly. It is not even all your fault. There are physical things like brain chemistry in your environment that are impacting you. But even greater is you are under spiritual attack right now. Satan would love nothing more than for you to believe that you are worthless, your situation is all your fault, and there's no way out. And the only thing you can do is to fall on your sword and give up. And what I'm here to say is that if you're there currently, please talk to me. Please talk to a leader. Please talk to my wife. Please talk to a parent. Please talk to a counselor. It does not matter. Do not isolate yourself. Unfortunately, you have to choose to believe what is in this book, guys. You have to choose to believe that there is a God that loves us this much. Because when you realize that the immense love and sacrifice pinned in that is real and that it's for you, it will keep that breath in your lungs. Even when your friends abandon you, even when you don't have the accomplishments that you think you should have, it is going to be all that you need in this life. And so, I'm saying that depression may not go away. If you're struggling with it, it may be something that you still deal with because this life is broken. But when you seek the kingdom and your choices, unlike Saul, reflect the desire to follow God continually, and that is a constant thing. Like I said, it's a slow, busy, a thing that you have to keep digging into. Satan can't whisper those lies to you. Satan can't whisper in your ear because he wants to take those small amounts of ground. He wants you to believe that I'm too fat, that I'm too alone, that I'm too slow, that I'm too stupid, that I'm not talented enough, that I'm not really worth the love that they keep talking about week after week in youth group or in church or whatever, that God can't really have that kind of love. Satan wants you to believe that lie. He will continue to take that ground from you if you give it to him, and he will strip you of all your humanity and the reality of you being strong in Christ. And that is why it is so important that you make a daily decision to go after Christ. So I just want to encourage you guys to know that you are loved, to know that God loves you. If this is nothing you struggle with, a friend will. You will lose friends to suicide and it will tear you apart. Sometime in your life, you will encounter this friend. It is too prevalent, the statistics are too low, and it is going to break your heart. But being able to love someone well, being able to love someone like Christ, despite whether you know they're going through it or not, is the best cure. Loving someone enough to bring them to youth group, loving someone enough to love them, even though they aren't the type of person that you want to love, is the cure that they need to feel included in life. Just you willing to listen could be the difference between someone giving up on life or not. However, let me make this clear, guys. Do not feel that it is your responsibility to fix or save them. It is not your responsibility to fix that person or save them. If it has escalated to a point of them actually contemplating suicide, you have to tell an adult or the authority for their own safety. Do not listen if that person tries to tell you that that they won't do it if you make a promise not to tell anyone. That is the most dangerous and reckless thing you could do with their life. It may hurt and it may feel like you've betrayed them if you tell an adult or you tell the authorities, but it is the best thing you can do to make sure that they get the help that they need. So I promised you guys heavy. Did I deliver? Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to wrap it up like that. I'm going to go. This passage in David's life is telling us that God is who he says he is. And we are part of this bigger story. We are with the same God that is with David, but we now have a son who died for us. But God didn't just stop in the Bible. 
and here's the core of the whole question. The questions to us are real things that people all around the world are missing. It's because of that that we should take seriously every choice we make, as it could be pulling us or someone we love, either closer or farther from God. Our actions have genuine consequences for the kingdom in this world. And most of all, guys, I want you to know that we have a God that loves us enough to send His Son to die and suffer a terrible death. So we don't have to pay the price for our real sin, for the brokenness that exists in this world and in this. That love alone is worth taking another breath. It doesn't matter how terrible your circumstances are. It doesn't matter how far you think you've fallen, how unlovable you are, how much you don't think that this is something that can apply to you. That love is real. And Jesus gave his life for you, and that means something. And we love you as leaders and as a church. And just know that. And the people in this room love you. Let's pray. God, um, sometimes life is hard. Um, sometimes it just puts a weight on our chest, and it feels difficult. Um, but I know in my own life the fact that I can be here today, that I can be a testimony that my life can have the confidence in life, to be able to serve you every day. It gives me a joy that I can't explain, a joy that I can't fully just pour out on these kids and let them understand. That a kid at the age of 12 to 14 who had completely given up on life could turn around and turn to you, and that would actually be the only thing that I need to keep living. That you could strip everything else away and you would be enough. That your love is all we need. God, I'm so grateful for the people representing this room, the flaws, the perfection, everything represented. I am just grateful for them and I love them so much. And I know that you love them. Thank you that you brought them here. And I just pray that if they encounter someone, that they can be a light for you, that they will. God, you're so good. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.